بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله على آله وأصحابه ومن وعلى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله This is the coronavirus um, version of Swiss again um, Just trying to make sure that I get content out to you guys as best I can and forgive me for not having all the bells and whistles but subhanAllah man you know this is uh this is how things are sometimes may Allah make it easy for us inshallah and you know just like a lot of us especially in New York City in quarantine not us we're in quarantine but been asked kind of the whole city to be somewhat careful how we live our lives but alhamdulillah for Allah for this dean and for us being together and we're starting this really important subject um, let's pick up where we left off last time we were talking about Mabadi and Ashara, right? Those 10 building blocks of learning that are so important that you want to know um, before you go into a subject. And that's one of the things I really hope that I can do at Swiss is my background is education. I did a degree in education. Like, I love it, man. It's, it's, it's my field. And it's something that I, I, I treasure. Um, so I also like to teach how to teach, if that makes sense. So as I said earlier, you can use it as a rubric. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to apply what we learned, the theory of those 10, um, and see how it plugs into the subject, of sort of fiqh. So here we go. Um, first of all, let's talk about its definition. And scholars of all sort of fiqh, they tend to define all sort of fiqh in two ways. Number one is by taking the compound word, soul is one word, fiqh is another. If you take an Arabic with me, all soul is a... Is a um, a jam uh, taksir, right? It's it's a plural, broken plural. Usu like rijal, usu So it's the foundations of Islamic law. So they would take that first word usu, and the second word fiqh, define usu, and then define fiqh, and then bring them together. That's the classic style. It's called tarif murakkab, where bring two words together. So usul of fiqh is made up of two words. Asul is the singular. You can see it right there. Um, you can see my the, the usul foundations, it's singular, is asul, foundation. Fiqh means to understand. The definition implies that usul, a fiqh, is the process needed to understand religious text. Uh, there was a great, great scholar, um, of, of old Imam uh, Safarini, uh, who said that, uh, not a Safarini, al Ustaz, uh, al Razi, who said that the word fiqh actually doesn't mean to understand, but fiqh means to understand something daqiq, something like really subtle, like a deeper level of understanding. So, you know, you don't say like fiqh to annaka mawjud. You don't say to someone like, I fiqh that you're here. You, you say fiqh annaka. Like you would use it to imply that you were able to discern something, that there was this set of what's called isharat or dalil. There were a set of dalil that directed you to something that wasn't apparent, right? So, so like if you see far, like smoke from far away, you could say like, I've understood that the smoke is indi indi an indication of a fire. So fiqh, uh, according to him, and also Imam Ibn Qayyim, means that you understand something very, very uh, subtle and deep, that it involves inference. That's very important because fiqh is really the science of inferring and deducing what the khitab of Allah is, what the message of God is. So Allah says in the Quran, like those people cannot understand the deeper speech, right? They can understand what you say. Ma, we don't nafqahu. We don't understand a lot of what you say. The Quran, they said to their prophet, like, we're not really getting the deeper meaning of what you say. That's why the prophet said, Whoever Allah wants good for gives them the fiqh, a deeper understanding of Allah. The second way is we talk about the had of usul of fiqh is a scientific definition where scholars said, listen, usul of fiqh is so popular now it has its own definition. There's no need to break down the compound definition 
Um, so they would say, Actually, it should be here. And this is a mistake I made years ago when I wrote this. And this is the definition of Imam Al Qadi Al Baydawi in a book called Al Minhaj. Right here, it should be Al Fiqh. So there shouldn't be an Arif Al here. Dalail Al Fiqh Ijmalan. Man, this definition is very important. Very important. If you look at it, look, there's three parts to it. One, knowing the evidence is a fiqh. Two, how to benefit from those evidences. And then the third is, what are the qualities of the one who can benefit? What are the, what's the academic criteria criterion so you see there's three parts that's why it's called usul fiqh not asl fiqh it's called usul fiqh because there's three foundations knowing the evidences knowing how to benefit with the evidences and knowing the qualities of the person who can employ those evidences for benefit and there's a lot happening here that um i want to share with you quickly number one is when he says istifada minha, how do you benefit so that implies that if someone doesn't know how to use these evidences, they won't make istifad, they'll make fasad. They'll make istifsad. So if, if I don't know how to use them correctly, I may actually do contribute to corruption. So the idea here is someone has to learn how to use the evidences properly to bring benefit. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, but remember what I just said. And then look what he says here, he doesn't say wahad al alim, he doesn't say the conditions of the alim, he says, what are the conditions of the benefitor? Mustafid is an active participle. What is the academic qualifications needed for somebody who brings benefit to people? So in other words, the ethos of scholarship, the ethos of the faqih is to benefit people, mashallah, by bringing them closer to Allah subhanahu ta'ala. Excuse me. That's really cool though. And you can see where uh, Imam al Badawi is, is taking his joint. It's like thorough, mashallah. As I just said, there are three parts to his definition. The first is that usul al fiqh is a science having its own definition. This means knowing what can and cannot be used as an evidence. So this is the first part. So the Qur'an is an evidence, the Sunnah is an evidence, Qiyas is an evidence, analogy, evidence. But what happened last night on the gram, that ain't evidence. Oh, well, last night on the gram, I saw this, so this, this must mean this is haram. I went to Costco and slipped and fell, so it must be haram to go to Costco. Personal experiences aren't allowed to be used as evidence. So ma'rifatu dala'il means two things. Not only am I learning what the evidences are, I'm also learning what is not allowed to be used as an evidence. That's why I put at the bottom here, there is duality happening here. And oftentimes that's the case with classical scholars. You read one thing, but what's inferred is the other reading of, what, of what's going on. Um, the word dalil, this is where we hear a lot of people talking about, right? The word dalil means an evidence. Dalilun nar. We say ad-dukhan, dalilun nar. So right here, there should be the word ad-dukhan, Smoke, dalilu nar. And is defined by scholars, and this is Imam al-Baji's definition of dalil. This is amazing, check this out. مَا يُمْكِنُ عِلْمُ مَطْلُوبِ الْخَبْرِ أَوْ ظَنِّهِ بِصَحِيحِ الْفِكْرِ فِيهِ الْمُؤَدِّي إِلَى عِلْمِهِ أَوْ ظَنِّهِ Man, it's not easy to translate this. But what al-Baji is saying is that a dalil is what can lead to a definitive or presumptive conclusion. I want you to remember that, that there are two types of dalil. A definitive dalil, self-explanatory, doesn't need a lot of work, and a dalil which is based on a presumption of a scholar. So now you can see where there's the etiquettes of differences because everything is not definitive. In fact, most of fiqh is gonna be the opposite. It's gonna be presumptive, presumptive. So a dalil is what can lead to a definitive or presumptive conclusion by properly learning and understanding it. Here he's talking about recognizing it and recognizing how to use it and how to employ it. So actually right there is almost another definition of what I talked about, knowing the evidences, how to benefit with the evidences, 
who can benefit with the evidences impact in that is if you look here there are two type of evidences what's called definitive qat'i qat'i a self-evident text that requires no interpretation investigation or understanding imam ibn hajib he said ma la yahtamilu ta'wil it's a text that doesn't doesn't allow for interpretation. Like when the Prophet said, pray five times. I mean, like, what's five? How do you interpret five? It's very clear. Tilka asharatun kamila. Allah said, if you fast three and then seven, that's ten. Ten is ten. That's definitive. Speculative or vanni, a text that requires some interpretation, investigation, or understanding. Imam Ibn Hajib said, ma yahtamilu ta'wil wal ijtihad what allows for interpretation and what demands ijtihad, meaning a scholar working to try to understand the text. So again, dalil, because he said ma'rifatu dalail, we're talking now about the first of the 10 parts of the, uh, of the building blocks of usul al-fiqh. We haven't got to usul al-fiqh, man. We're still in the 10 building blocks. Ma'rifatu dalail, what's dalail? The plural of dalil. Dalail is also jama taksir for my Arabic students. What does dalil mean? An evidence, and, and just for your information, a dalil is an evidence for something besides itself. So the smoke isn't the fire. My footprints isn't me, but my fo footprints are an evidence for me, and the fire is an evidence for me. So the, the evidences of the Quran and Sunnah often are going to be brought together to prove a ruling that they're not explicitly associated to. In that process, there's going to be two type of evidences. Number one, qat'i, self-evident, right? So that's going to be the unique one that is actually evidencing itself, rarely. And the second, speculative, which is the mass majority of fiqh. Mabni ala dhan. That's why Imam al-Baydawi in al-Manahaji said, wa dhanna fi tariqihi. You know, he said that in the process of coming to a fiqhi conclusion, there is a... a a bit of speculation, speculation, or like a presumptive process. That's important because there's no takfir in that. There's not calling someone who's qualified an innovator out of Islam. What we see sometimes with some of the neo traditional movements or even some of the Salafi movements is that they will actually declare someone out of Islam who's a qualified scholar or groups of scholars, not based on the definitive issues, but over the speculative issues. At ground zero in communities, do you think Tarawih? is definitive or speculative? It's speculative. But what do people fight over? Tarawi. Do you think, for example, the um, eating meat outside is definitive or speculative? It's speculative, but people fight over it like it's definitive. So you can see where there's a lot of issues that will sort of feel can solve for, mashallah, local communities that we'll talk about in the future. Um, <clears throat> the word dalil means, like as I said earlier, an evidence for something besides itself. And what did I mean by speculative? There's a spelling error there, implying that scholar's assumption is so strong, such that it will guide his approach or her approach on an issue before and after he reaches a conclusion. We're gonna break that down in the future, inshallah. <coughs> what do we mean by concrete or qati, explicit, implying that conclusion of the scholar based on principles and his assessment is definitive, meaning his or her engagement in that process was limited. There was not a lot of scholarly engagement in that. So if you ask most children, you know, what's the ruling on lying, haram? They're not scholars, but that's qat'i thubut. Final thoughts on Dalil here again is the definition ma yumkinu ilmul matibu bil khabari aw dhanni. So here you understand why he says ma yumkinu ilm al matlub. You 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 trying to seek a a a, a knowledge based presumption based on either khabari or dhanni, khabari or dhanni, this implies that there's going to be some leeway, bisahih al-fikri, the right process, meaning following the process of usul al-fiqh, fihi, in that process, fihi, al-mu'addi ila ilmihi al dhanni, which is going to help and aid that person's conclusion or presumption. It's not easy to translate that, man. Next time, inshallah, we're going to start to talk about the evidences. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. Wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullah.